What's up, and welcome to Crash Course AP Macroeconomics Edition, Video 1 on Alex Academy. Make sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Scarcity. So scarcity is when individuals, businesses, and governments have unlimited wants but limited resources. Scarcity is the main problem of economics that is trying to determine and try to solve. Because, you know, people are greedy, and sometimes people also just need basic things that they don't have. Some people don't have food, and some people just want like the latest iPhone, and that promotes problems of scarcity. Consumer goods. Consumer goods are goods that are made for direct consumption. So these are goods that you and I will want to buy from different stores and help drive up the macro economy. So one example would be butter, of course. Capital goods. Capital goods are goods that are made for indirect consumption. So these are goods that are usually made to help businesses and others invest and try to create something bigger. So this combine for growing wheat would be an example of a capital good because it helps farmers to grow more food. Trade-offs. So in economics, we oftentimes face trade-offs. Trade-offs are all possible options given up when you make up a choice. So when you choose one thing over the other things, you have to sort of serve a trade-off. Oh. Opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the one best option given up when you make a choice, including money, time, or other foregone options. So for opportunity cost, it's not all the possible options like a trade-off. It's just the one thing that you give up to get another thing. Centrally plan economy. So in this economic system, the government owns the resources and decides what to make, how to make it, and who gets it. In this economy, there is total governmental control of the economy, and many times we see this in communist nations. On the other side, there is the free market economy. The free market economy is a system where individuals own the resources and decides what to make, how to make it, and who gets it. So the government really is not very involved in this type of economy. Most economies, however, are mixed economies, including the United States, and this contains a mix of free and central economies. So in the U.S., we have big businesses like Coca-Cola, but we also have different types of government-owned corporations, such as Amtrak, which is the transit service. Investment. So investment is business spending on capital. Capital is tools and machinery that makes businesses more productive. So you might see on Shark Tank, the people are really trying to get investment into their products. Capital stock. Capital stock is the amount of capital businesses have. So the more capital stock, the more output they can make. And businesses really want to have more capital stock. So in the future, they can really grow their business. Production possibilities curve. This is a model that is used by economists to see how much a business or a country can actually produce two different types of goods and the trade-off between the two goods. So sometimes we see this with the guns and butter scenario, and sometimes we see this with cars and clothing. So if you're on the frontier, you're producing things at maximum output. If you're inside, such as at point E, you are actually not being the most efficient with your resources and you can do better. And if you're outside at point D, this is non-sustainable growth, and eventually you won't be able to stay out there unless you invest in capital machinery, which would shift your PPC outward. So some people say being at point D is like pulling all-nighters. You can do it a few times, although usually it can't last into the future. Shifting the PPC. So we just talked about this a little bit, but to shift the PPC, there are many factors. So one, you can change the resource quantity or quality. If you start to have more resources and be able to produce more, you can shift your PPC outward. And sometimes if you want to improve the quality, sometimes that comes at a cost and you can only produce less. There can also be a change in technology. So technology is a capital good. If you have better tech like automation, you can make things faster and also change in trade. So this is about a change in the amount of consumption. So sometimes you want to sort of have one thing over another. So if you want more cars, you would sort of shift on the curve to the side with more cars instead of clothing, as we last saw. Phillips curve. This is a model that shows the short run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. 
So in the short run, you're going to have a difference between inflation and unemployment. If inflation is high, you will generally have low unemployment and vice versa. So this is the trade-off between these two factors in the economy. And at long run equilibrium, you'll be right straight vertical. Natural rate of unemployment. So this is the vertical graph we talked about. At the normal rate of unemployment, you have the unemployment rate where it fluctuates between 5% and you have inflation as 3%. And this is what many governments such as the US try to target. Comparative advantage. So this is the ability of an individual, a firm, or a country to produce a good or service at a lower opportunity cost than competitors. So if you have a comparative advantage with others, you want to produce that good because then when you trade, both of you can get more out of it. Absolute advantage. So this is the ability of an individual, a firm, or a country to produce more of a good or service than competitors using the same amount of resources. So this is generally looked at through pure objective numbers. So production quotas, or also the time it takes to make a certain thing. So a person can have two absolute advantages, like make more of both things, but comparatively, they're still going to be better at one of them. Ceteris paribus is a Latin phrase that means all other things held constant. When we're dealing with economics, we always have to throw in this phrase so it doesn't get too complicated for now. Rational choice theory. So this is a popular theory in political science that explains the actions of voters as well as consumers in the economy. And it shows that individuals act in their own best interests, which they carefully weigh the costs and benefits of possible alternatives. So it really says that rational people make marginal decisions and they always host a cost benefit analysis to see which is better. And this is the example of the criminal. So if a criminal really needs something and they might get arrested nine out of 10 times, even if they try to get that one out of 10 times, if they're able to be successful, they're thinking rationally. Incentive. Incentive is a positive or negative environmental stimulus that motivates behavior. Many times governments will give out incentives or businesses will get out investments to incentives, sorry, to try to make people go buy more. Externality. So an externality is an economic side effect of a good or service that generates benefits or costs to someone other than the person deciding how much to produce or consume. The greatest example of this is pollution. Many times, businesses, because they want to make more, they sort of disregard the environmental aspects of things. And as a result, they produce lots of pollution. And it can be good or bad, as in this case, pollution is bad because it affects everyone that is around us. In 1776, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations. And this book promoted laissez-faire economics, and it also promoted a free market economy, and it was one of the first to detail supply and demand economics by consumers as we know it today. Positive versus normative statements. So positive statements are really just descriptions of things, such as that chair is red, while normative statements are statements of how things should be, so that red chair should be blue. And economists use these two statements to detail the current state of the economy and what the economy should be or ought to be. The product market is places where individuals buy goods and services from different businesses. So as consumers, we often come to the product market to buy different types of goods. Factor market is a place where businesses buy the factors of production from individuals. So if a business needs like an accountant, for example, they will go out and hire from the factor market. Transfer payments. These are payments that are made by the government to meet a specific goal rather than pay for goods and services. So one example is welfare. The government will transfer money to people who don't have their basic needs met. Circular flow model. This ties in all these different factors and businesses and households together. So on one end, you have the factor market, which households will sell things and firms will buy. And on the other end, you have the product market where firms will sell and households will buy. And then you have these two households and businesses really just creating the circular flow of money from different costs to incomes to consumption to revenue. And this is really just how money flows in our macro economy. The law of supply. 
This is a law that shows the direct relationship between price and quantity supplied. So if you have an increase in price, you'll also have an increase in quantity for supply and vice versa. The law of demand states that there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity. So if you have a higher price, you'll generally have a lower quantity and vice versa. AS and AD graph demand shift. So AS and AD, aggregate supply and aggregate demand, really talk about all the total supplies and demands in an economy. So it can shift for a number of reasons. The demand curve can shift. So there are tastes and preferences. So if people start to like a different type of thing, let's say cheese, for example, let's say people like one kind of cheese over another. So demand for that type of cheese will shift. Also, the number of consumers. If people suddenly start going like vegan and they stop eating cheese, then the consumers will go down. Price of related goods, so substitutes and complements. Maybe people like butter instead of cheese, so they decide to start buying more butter, so demand for cheese will start uh, shifting down because these two are sort of like substitute goods, kind of, a little. Maybe that's a bad example. Another example would be complement goods. So this is like peanut butter and jelly, you know, because these two go together. So if one demand goes up, the other one would generally go up as well. A fourth reason is income. You know, if you're poor, you're not going to buy like specialty cheeses. And five is future expectations. So if, let's say, the price of milk is going to go up in the future and you really want your cheese, so you'll probably demand a lot of cheese now before the price of milk goes later and starts to affect the cheese price. Now we'll talk about a supply shift. So prices and availability of inputs. So let's stick with cheese. So maybe now it costs more to raise a cow to produce milk. So obviously the price of cheese is going to increase. Also number of producers. If say big business starts to consolidate all the farms, now you won't have as many independent farmers. So now this big business can control the price of cheese almost technology. Maybe it becomes cheaper to produce cheese because of automation, so that's good. Also, government action. These are generally through taxes and subsidies. Maybe, say, the government gives the cheese and milk industry even more subsidies than they have today. That's going to increase things as well. And also, expectations and future profit. Different producers might decide to alter the supply of cheese to make more or sort of sell more things. Price ceiling. This is a government control. It is a legal cap of prices designed to keep prices artificially low. So, for example, a price ceiling could be instituted to keep bread prices below a certain point because, you know, people need to eat bread. And if bread is too expensive, that's obviously not good because riots will start happening. Just ask France. So, in this example, you have a price ceiling, which actually seems counterintuitive. It's actually below the current price. So now, the supply and the demand, they have to shift to go below the price ceiling. So in this case, you have more demand than supply, and this, of course, creates a shortage. Price floor. So this is a minimum legal price sellers can sell a product for. So this is the exact opposite of what a price ceiling is. So in this example, there are many examples such as a minimum wage or a farmer subsidy to keep prices above a certain point because you know you don't want people making like two dollars an hour and you know we have to support farmers so in this case you have more supply than actual demand so in this case you have an excess of things which they call a surplus subsidy so this is when the government pays producers to encourage them to produce more or not so in the U.S., there are tons of subsidies to farmers. That's just one example. The corn industry, especially, you see they have all these subsidies, so they pr start producing different corn products like high fructose corn syrup, which is literally in everything we eat. Check out AP Environmental Science for more stuff. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure to check out part two over here on the left and the full AP playlist over here on the right. And also subscribe if you haven't already and like, comment, and share with your friends. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one.